Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, written by Robin Wall Kimmerer, read by Sen Naomi Kirsch Schultz. Chapter 30 Shkitagen, People of the Seventh Fire so much depends upon the lightning of this fire, so neatly laid on the cold ground and circled round by stones. A platform of dry maple kindling, a floor of fine twiglets snapped from the underside of a fir, a nest of shredded bark ready for the coal over which broken pine branches are balanced to draw the flame upward. Plenty of fuel, plenty of oxygen. All the elements are in place. But without the spark, it is only a pile of dead sticks. So much depends on the spark. It was a point of pride in my family that we learned to light a fire with a single match. My father was our teacher along with the woods themselves, and we learned without lessons, by playing and watching and wanting to emulate his comfort in wild places. He patiently showed us how to search out the right materials. Incrementally, we observed the architecture that would feed the flame. He put great store in a fine wood pile, and many of our days in the woods were spent felling hauling, and splitting. Firewood warms you twice, he would always say, as we emerge from the woods hot and sweaty. In the doing of it, we learned to recognize the trees by their bark, by their wood, and by the way they burned for different purposes. Pitchy pine for light, beech for a bed of coals, sugar maples to bake pies in the reflector oven. He never said so directly, but fire-making was more than just a woods craft skill. To build a good fire, a person had to work. There were high standards. No piece of half-rotten birch was permitted in his woodpile. Punky, he would say, and toss it aside. Knowledge of the flora was a given, as was respectful treatment of the woods, so that you gathered without doing harm. There was always plenty of standing deadwood there for the taking, already dry and seasoned. Only natural materials went into a good fire. No paper or, heaven forbid, gasoline, and green wood was an affront to both aesthetics and ethics. No lighters allowed. We earned high praise for the ideal one-match fire, but plenty of encouragement if we needed a dozen. And at some point, it became natural and easy. No feet at all. I found a secret that always worked for me. To sing to the fire as I touched the match to tinder. Woven into my dad's fire teachings was appreciation for all the woods gave us, and a sense of our responsibility for reciprocity. We never left a camping place without leaving a pile of wood for the next people on the trail. Paying attention, being prepared and patient, and doing it right the first time. The skill and the values were so closely entwined that fire-making became for us an emblem of a certain kind of virtue. Once we mastered the one-match fire, then came the one-match fire in the rain and the snow. With the right materials, carefully assembled and respect for the ways of air and wood, you could always have a fire. The power of that simple act with a single match you could make people feel safe and happy, convert a bunch of sodden individuals into a convivial group thinking of stew and songs. It was an amazing gift to carry in your pocket, 
and a serious responsibility to be used well. Fire building was a vital connection to those who came before. Potawatomi, or more accurately, Bodwewadmi in our own language, means people of the fire. It seemed only right that this was a skill we should master, a gift to share. I began to think that to really understand fire, I needed a bow drill in my hand. Now, I try to make a no-match fire, to conjure a coal in the old way, with bow and drill, a friction fire, rubbing two sticks together. Wewene, I say to myself, in a good time, in a good way, there are no shortcuts. It must unfold in the right way when all the elements are present, mind and body harnessed in unison, when all the tools have been properly made and all the parts united in purpose, it is so easy. But if they're not, it will be futile. Until there is balance and perfect reciprocity between the forces, you can try and fail and try and fail again. I know, and yet, despite the need, you must swallow your sense of urgency, calm your breathing so that the energy goes not to frustration, but to fire. After we were all grown up and fully fire competent, my father made sure his grandchildren could also light a one-match fire. At 83, he teaches fire building at our native youth science camp, sharing the same lessons he gave us. They have a race to have their little blazes burn through a string stretched across the fire circle. One day, after the contest has been won, he sits on a stump, poking at the fire. Did you know, he asks them, that there are four kinds of fire? I am expecting his lesson on hardwoods and softwoods, but there is something else on his mind. Well, first, of course, there's this campfire you made. You can cook on it, keep warm next to it. It's a good place to sing, and it keeps the coyotes away. And toast marshmallows, pipes up one of the kids. You bet and bake potatoes, make bannock, you can cook most anything on a campfire. Who knows the other kinds of fire, he asks. Forest fires? One of the students tries tentatively. Sure, he says. What the people used to call thunderbird fires, forest fires ignited by lightning. Sometimes they'd get put out by the rain, but sometimes they could turn into huge wildfires. They could be so hot they would destroy everything for miles around. Nobody likes that kind of fire. But our people learned to set fires that were small and in just the right place and time so that they helped rather than hurt. The people set these fires on purpose to take care of the land to help the blueberries grow or to make meadows for deer. He holds up a sheet of birch bark. In fact, look at all that birch bark you used in your fire. Young paper birches only grow up after fire, so our ancestors burned forests to create clearings for birch. The symmetry of using fire to create fire-building materials was not lost on them. They needed birch bark, so they used their own fire science to create birch forests. Fires help out a lot of plants and animals. We are told that's why the Creator gave people the fire stick, to bring good things to the land. A lot of the time, you hear people say that the best thing people can do for nature is to stay away from it and let it be. There are places where that's absolutely true, and our people respected that. 
but we were also given the responsibility to care for land. What people forget is that that means participating, that the natural world relies on us to do good things. You don't show your love and care by putting what you love behind a fence. You have to be involved. You have to contribute to the well-being of the world. The land gives us so many gifts. Fire is a way we can give back. In modern times, the public thinks fire is only destructive, but they've forgotten or simply never knew how people used fire as a creative force. The fire stick was like a paintbrush on the landscape. Touch it here in a small dab and you've made a green meadow for elk. A light scatter there burns off the brush so the oaks make more acorns. Stipple it under the canopy and it thins the stand to prevent catastrophic fire. Draw the fire brush along the creek and the next spring it's a thick stand of yellow willows. A wash over a grassy meadow turns it blue with camas. To make blueberries, let the paint dry for a few years and repeat. Our people were given the responsibility to use fire to make things beautiful and productive. It was our art and our science. The birch forests maintained by indigenous burning were a cornucopia of gifts. Bark for canoes, sheathing for wigwams, and tools and baskets. Scrolls for writing, and of course, tinder for fires. But these are only the obvious gifts. Both paper birch and yellow birch are hosts to the fungus Inonotus obliquus, which erupts through the bark to form sterile conchs, a fruiting body it looks like a grainy black tumor the size of a softball. Its surface is cracked and crusted, studded with cinders, as if it had been burnt. Known to people of the Siberian birch forests as chaga, it is a valued traditional medicine. Our people call it shkitagen. It takes some effort to find a black knob of shkitagen and then dislodge it from the tree. But cut open, the body of the conch is banded in glowing shades of gold and bronze with the texture of spongy wood, all constructed of tiny threads and air-filled pores. Our ancestors discovered a remarkable property of this being, although some say it spoke its own use to us through its burnt exterior and golden heart. Shkitagin is a tinder fungus, a fire keeper, and a good friend to the people of the fire. Once an ember meets Shkitagin, it will not go out, but smolders slowly in the fungal matrix, holding its heat. Even the smallest spark, so fleeting and easily lost, will be held and nurtured if it lands on a cube of Shkitagin. And yet, as forests are felled and fire suppression jeopardizes species that depend upon burned ground, it is getting harder and harder to find. Okay, what are the other kinds of fire, my father asks, as he adds a stick to the fire at his feet. Tayotoreki knows. Sacred fire, like for ceremonies. Of course, my dad says, the fires we use to carry prayers for healing, for sweat lodges. That fire represents our life, the spiritual teachings that we've had from the very beginning. The sacred fire is the symbol of life and spirit, so we have special fire keepers to care for them. You might not get to be around those other fires very often, he says. But there's fire you must tend to every day. The hardest one to take care of is the one right here, he says, tapping his finger against his chest. Your own fire, your spirit. 
We all carry a piece of that sacred fire within us. We have to honor it and care for it. You are the fire keeper. Now, remember that you are responsible for all those kinds of fire, he reminds them. That's our job, especially we men. In our way, there is balance between men and women. Men are responsible for caring for fire, and women are responsible for water. Those two forces balance each other out. We need both to live. Now here's something you can't forget about fire, he says. As he stands before the kids, I hear echoes of the first teachings when Nana Bojo received the same fire teachings from his father that my dad is passing on today. You must always remember that fire has two sides. Both are very powerful. One side is the force of creation. Fire can be used for good, like on your hearth or in ceremony. Your own heart fire is also a force for good. But that same power can be turned to destruction. Fire can be for the good of the land, but it can also destroy. Your own fire can be used for ill, too. Human people can never forget to understand and respect both sides of this power. They are far stronger than we are. You must learn to be careful, or they can destroy everything that has been created. We have to create balance. Fire has another meaning for Anishinaabe people as well, corresponding to the eras in the life of our nation. The fires refer to the places we have lived and the events and the teachings that surrounded them. Anishinaabe knowledge keepers, our historians and scholars, carry the narrative of the people from our earliest origin, long before the coming of the offshore people, the Zaganash. They also carry what came after, for our histories are inevitably braided together with our futures. This story is known as the Seventh Fire Prophecy, and it has been shared widely by Eddie Benton Benai and other elders. The era of the first fire found Anishinaabe people living in the dawn lands of the Atlantic shore. The people were given powerful spiritual teachings, which they were to follow for the good of the people and the land, for they are one. But a prophet foretold that the Anishinaabe would have to move to the west, or else they would be destroyed in the changes that were to come. They were to search until they found the place, quote, where the food grows on the water, unquote. And there they would make their new home in safety. The leaders heeded the prophecy and led the nation west, along the St. Lawrence River, far inland near what is now Montreal. There, they rekindled the flame carried with them on the journey in bowls of Shkitagen. A new teacher arose among the people and counseled them to continue still farther west, where they would camp on the shore of a very big lake. Trusting in the vision the people followed, and the time of the second fire began as they made camp on the shores of Lake Huron, near what is now Detroit. Soon, though, the Anishinaabe became divided into three groups, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi, who took different routes to seek their homes around the Great Lakes. The Potawatomi traveled to the south from southern Michigan all the way to Wisconsin. As the prophecies foretold, however, the bands were reunited several generations later at Manitoulin Island, forming a union known as the Three Fires Confederacy that remains to this day. In the time of the third fire, they found the place foretold in prophecy, where the food grows on the water, and established their new homelands in the country 
of wild rice. The people lived well for a long time under the care of maples and birches, sturgeon and beaver, eagle and loon. The spiritual teachings that had guided them kept the people strong, and together they flourished in the bosom of their non-human relatives. At the time of the fourth fire, the history of another people came to be braided into ours. Two prophets arose among the people foretelling the coming of the light-skinned people in ships from the east, but their visions differed in what was to follow. The path was not clear, as it cannot be with the future. The first prophet said that if the offshore people, the Zaganash, came in brotherhood, they would bring great knowledge. Combined with Anishinaabe ways of knowing, this would form a great new nation. But the second prophet sounded a warning. He said that what looks like the face of brotherhood might be the face of death. These new people might come with brotherhood or they might come with greed for the riches of our land. How do we know which face is the true one? If the fish became poisoned and the water unfit to drink, we would know which face they wore. And for their actions, the Zaganash came to be known, instead, as Chimokman, the Long Knife People. The prophecies described what eventually became history. They warned the people of those who would come among them with black robes and black books, with promises of joy and salvation. The prophet said that if the people turned against their own sacred ways and followed this black robe path, then the people would suffer for many generations. Indeed, the burial of our spiritual teachings in the time of the fifth fire nearly broke the hoop of the nation. People became separated from their homelands and from each other as they were forced onto reservations. Their children were taken from them to learn the Zaganash ways. Forbidden by law to practice their own religion, they nearly lost an ancient worldview. Forbidden to speak their languages, a universe of knowing vanished in a generation. The land was fragmented, the people separated, the old ways blowing away in the wind. Even the plants and animals began to turn their faces away from us. The time was foretold when the children would turn away from the elders. People would lose their way and their purpose in life. They prophesied that in the time of the sixth fire, the cup of life would almost become the cup of grief. And yet, even after all of this, there is something that remains, a coal that has not been extinguished. At the first fire so long ago, the people were told that it is their spiritual lives that will keep them strong. They say that a prophet appeared with a strange and distant light in his eyes. The young man came to the people with the message that in the time of the seventh fire, a new people would emerge with a sacred purpose. It would not be easy for them. They would have to be strong and determined in their work, for they stood at a crossroads. The ancestors looked to them from the flickering light of distant fires. In this time, the young would turn back to the elders for teachings and find that many had nothing to give. The people of the seventh fire do not yet walk forward. Rather, they are told to turn around and retrace the steps of the ones who brought us here. Their sacred purpose is to walk back along the red road of our ancestors' path and to gather up all the fragments that lay scattered along the trail. Fragments of land, tatters of language, bits of songs, stories, sacred teachings, all that was dropped along the way. 
our elders say that we live in the time of the seventh fire. We are the ones the ancestors spoke of, the ones who will bend to the task of putting things back together to rekindle the flames of the sacred fire, to begin the rebirth of a nation. And so it has come to pass that all over Indian country there is a movement for revitalization of language and culture, growing from the dedicated work of individuals who have the courage to breathe life into ceremonies, to gather speakers to reteach the language, plant old seed varieties, restore native landscapes, bring the youth back to the land. The people of the seventh fire walk among us. They are using the fire stick of the original teachings to restore health to the people, to help them bloom again and bear fruit. The seventh fire prophecy presents a second vision for the time that is upon us. It tells that all the people of the earth will see that the path ahead is divided they must make a choice in their path to the future. One of the roads is soft and green with new grass. You could walk barefoot there. The other path is scorched black, hard. The cinders would cut your feet. If the people choose the grassy path, then life will be sustained. But if they choose the cinder path, the damage they have wrought upon the earth will turn against them and bring suffering and death to earth's people. We do indeed stand at the crossroads. Scientific evidence tells us we are close to the tipping point of climate change, the end of fossil fuels, the beginning of resource depletion. Ecologists estimate that we would need seven planets to sustain the lifeways we have created. And yet those lifeways lacking balance, justice, and peace have not brought us contentment. They have brought us the loss of our relatives in a great wave of extinction. Whether or not we want to admit it, we have a choice ahead, a crossroads. I don't fully comprehend prophecy and its relation to history, but I know that metaphor is a way of telling truth far greater than scientific data. I know that when I close my eyes and envision the crossroads that our elders foresaw, it runs like a movie in my head. The fork in the road stands atop a hill. To the left, the path is soft and green and spangled with dew. You want to go barefoot. The path to the right is ordinary pavement, deceptively smooth at first, but then it drops out of sight into the hazy distance. Just over the horizon, it is buckled with heat, broken to jagged shards. In the valleys below the hill, I see the people of the seventh fire walking toward the crossroads with all they have gathered. They carry in their bundles the precious seeds for a change of worldview. Not so they can return to some atavistic utopia, but to find the tools that allow us to walk into the future. So much has been forgotten, but it is not lost as long as the land endures and we cultivate people who have the humility and ability to listen and to learn and the people are not alone. All along the path, non-human people help. What knowledge the people have forgotten is remembered by the land. The others want to live, too. The path is lined with all the world's people in all colors of the medicine wheel, red, white, black, yellow, who understand the choice ahead, who share a vision of respect and reciprocity, of fellowship with the more-than-human world. Men with fire, women with water to re-establish balance, to renew the world. 
friends and allies all there falling in step, forming a great long line headed for the barefoot path. They are carrying Shkitagen lanterns, tracing their path in light. But of course, there's another road visible in the landscape, and from the high place I see the rooster tails of dust thrown up as its travelers speed ahead, engines roaring, drunk. They drive fast and blind, not even seeing who they are about to run over or the good green world they speed through. Bullies swagger along the road with a can of gasoline and a lit torch. I worry who will get to the crossroads first, who will make the choices for us all. I recognize the melted road, the cinder path. I've seen it before. I remember a night when my five-year-old woke afraid of the thunder. It was only as I held her and came fully awake that I thought to ask why there was thunder in January. Instead of stars, the light outside her window was wobbly orange, and the air vibrated with the pulsing of fire. I dashed to get the baby from her crib and led us all outside wrapped in blankets. It was not the house on fire, but the sky. Waves of heat came billowing across the winter bare fields like a desert wind. The darkness was burned away in a massive blaze that filled the horizon. My thoughts raced. A plane crash? A nuclear blast? I bundled the girls into the pickup and ran back in for the keys, thinking only to get them away to go to the river to run. I spoke as calmly as I could, in measured tones, as if fleeing an inferno in our pajamas was no cause for panic. Mama, are you afraid? asked the small voice at my elbow as I tore down the road. No, honey, everything's going to be okay. She was nobody's fool. Then, Mama, why are you talking so quietly? We drove safely to our friend's house ten miles away, knocking on their door for refuge in the middle of the night. The flare was dimmer from their back porch, but still flickering eerily. We put the children to bed with cocoa, poured ourselves a whiskey, and flipped on the news. A natural gas pipeline had exploded less than a mile from our farm. Evacuations were underway, and crews were on the scene. A few days later, when it was safe, we drove to the site. The hay fields were a crater. Two horse barns were incinerated. The road had melted away, and in its absence, there was a track of sharp cinders. I was a climate refugee for just one night, but it was enough. The waves of heat we are feeling now as a result of climate change aren't yet as crushing as the ones that rocked us that night, but they too are out of season. I never thought that night of what I might save from a burning house, but that is the question we all face in a time of climate change. What do you love too much to lose? Who and what will you carry to safety? I wouldn't lie to my daughter now. I am afraid as afraid today as I was then for my children and for the good green world. We cannot comfort ourselves by saying it's going to be okay. We need what's in those bundles. We can't escape by going to the neighbors, and we can't afford to talk quietly. My family could go home again the next day, but what about the Alaskan towns being swallowed alive by the rising Bering Sea? the Bangladeshi farmer whose fields are flooded. Oil burning in the gulf, everywhere you look you see it coming. Coral reefs lost to warming oceans, forest fires in Amazonia, 
the frozen Russian taiga and inferno vaporizing carbon stored there for 10,000 years. These are the fires of the scorched path. Let this not be the seventh fire. I pray we have not already passed the fork in the road. What does it mean to be the people of the seventh fire, to walk back along the ancestral road and pick up what was left behind? How do we recognize what we should reclaim and what is dangerous refuse? What is truly medicine for the living earth and what is a drug of deception? None of us can recognize every piece, let alone carry it all. We need each other to take a song, a word, a story, a tool, a ceremony, and put it in our bundles. Not for ourselves, but for the ones yet to be born, for all of our relations. Collectively, we assemble from the wisdom of the past, a vision for the future, a worldview shaped by mutual flourishing. Our spiritual leaders interpret this prophecy as the choice between the deadly road of materialism that threatens the land and the people, and the soft path of wisdom, respect, and reciprocity that is held in the teachings of the first fire. It is said that if the people choose the green path, then all races will go forward together to light the eighth and final fire of peace and brotherhood forging the great nation that was foretold long ago. Supposing we are able to turn from destruction and choose the green path, what will it take to light the eighth fire? I don't know, but our people have a long acquaintance with fire. Perhaps there are lessons in the building of a handmade fire that will help us now, teachings gleaned from the seventh fire. Fires do not make themselves. The earth provides the materials and the laws of thermodynamics. Humans must provide the work and the knowledge and the wisdom to use the power of fire for good. The spark itself is a mystery, but we know that before that fire can be lit, we have to gather the tinder, the thoughts, and the practices that will nurture the flame. In making a handmade fire, so much depends on the plants, two pieces of cedar, a yielding board, a straight shaft made for each other, male and female from the same tree. The bow, a flexible wand of striped maple, a shapely grip to bear the bowstring twined of dogbane fiber. Stroking back and forth, back and forth, the shaft spinning, feeling its way into the bowl that burns to meet its shape. So much depends on the body, each joint at the right angle, left arm wrapped around knee and braced at the shin, left leg bent, back stretched, shoulders locked, left forearm bearing down, right arm pushes and pulls in one smooth draw without breaking the plane of the upright shin. So much depends on the architecture, stability in three dimensions, and fluidity in the fourth. So much depends on the motion of the shaft against the board, so that movement becomes friction, heat building and building, spinning and spinning the drill down on the bowl, burning its way into a black and shining space so smooth the pressure and heat burn from the wood a fine powder which gathers together in its need for warmth until it forms into a coal that falls under its own weight through a notch in the board onto the waiting tinder. So much depends on the tinder, the fly-away bits of cattail fluff, the softened wads of cedar bark, rubbed between hands until the fibers are loose and mingled with their own dust. The shreds of yellow birch bark 
torn like confetti and all formed into a ball, like a warbler's nest, a rough, loose weave, a nest for a firebird, where a coal will be laid, the whole wrapped in a sleeve of birch bark open at the ends for the entrance and the exit of air. Time and again, I get to this point where the heat has built and the fragrant smoke from the burning cedar bowl begins to rise around my face. Almost, I think, almost, and then my hand slips and the spindle goes flying and the coal breaks apart and I'm left with no fire and an aching arm. My struggle with the bow drill is a struggle to achieve reciprocity, to find a way that knowledge, body, mind, and spirit can all be brought into harmony, to harness human gifts, to create a gift for the earth. It's not that the tools are lacking, the pieces are all there, but something is missing. I do not have it. I hear again the teachings of the seventh fire. Turn back along the path and gather up what has been left beside the trail. And I remember Shkitagen, the firekeeper fungus, the holder of the spark that cannot be extinguished. I go back to where the wisdom lives in the woods and humbly ask for help. I lay down my gift in return for all that is given and start again. So much depends on the spark that is nurtured by Shkitagen gold and kindled by a song. So much depends on the air, its passage through the tinder nest strong enough to make it glow, not so strong as to blow it out. Breath of wind and not of man. Bundle swung back and forth through Creator's breath to make it grow, embracing bark and dust, propagating heat on heat. Oxygen is fuel for fuel until smoke plumes billow in sweet fragrance. Light erupts, and you hold in your hand a fire. As the seventh fire people walk the path, we should also be looking for Shkitagen, the ones who hold the spark that cannot be extinguished. We find the fire keepers all along the path and greet them with gratitude and humility that against all odds they have carried the ember forward, waiting to be breathed into life. In seeking the Shkitagen of the forest and the Shkitagen of the spirit, we ask for open eyes and open minds, hearts open enough to embrace our more-than-human kin, a willingness to engage intelligences not our own. We'll need trust in the generosity of the good green earth to provide this gift and trust in human people to reciprocate. I don't know how the eighth fire will be lit, but I do know we can gather the tinder that will nurture the flame, that we can be Shkitagen to carry the fire as it was carried to us. Is this not a holy thing, the kindling of this fire? So much depends on the spark. This has been Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, written by Robin Wall Kimmerer, read by Sen Naomi Kirst Schultz. Chapter 30, Shkitagen, People of the Seventh Fire. Thanks for reading.